Welcome back to week two. This week we are focusing on the international normative and legal uh, basis for the protection of freedom of expression. We've looked at the international system and the regional systems. We are also going to consider a national system, that of the First Amendment, because of what I believe to be the global influence uh, and historical influence of um, the First Amendment throughout the last at least uh, 50 years. And we are very lucky uh, to have with us for this segment President Lee Bollinger, very uh, renowned uh, First Amendment scholar and uh, the author of uh, many books on, um, on the First Amendment. So, uh, President Bollinger, thank you very much for joining us for, for this uh, segment. I'm going to start with uh, a, a bit of an what I find to be an enigmatic uh, quote that you have made yours in many ways because I've, I've noted that you um, mention it in several of your books. It's um, Holmes, uh, who, who said in, um, in one of his uh, earlier decisions that uh, the First Amendment is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. Can you maybe tell us uh, what you think Holmes mean and what does it mean to you? Well, I think, uh, I think it's a very powerful statement yeah. uh, because to get right to the point, I mean, I think that by saying that, he is expressing some doubt in his own mind as to whether what he is arguing for under freedom of speech and press is actually a good idea or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but to do that is to do exactly what it is that we hope we will achieve through freedom of speech and press. That is, uh, I mean, I think of freedom of speech and press, uh, First Amendment, as really relating to how we want to be as people and uh, understanding ourselves. I mean, he also says in that uh, decision, persecution for the expression of opinions is perfectly logical. Mm -hmm. um, that's an extraordinary thing to say, that mm -hmm. intolerance is natural. Uh, it's also uh, striking to say, I believe we should take these steps to overcome that natural impulse, but I may be wrong. It's an experiment, and I think uh, what he is doing, I think, is setting up as a model of uh, just how we want to be in the society, in freedom of speech and press, but more generally. Uh, that is, um, understanding that we simply cannot know for sure about many things, uh, including ideas that we may think of as fundamental, like mm -hmm. free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of spirit of inquiry, of challenge, of listening, yeah. of debating, uh, is, I, I think, the uh, revealed by that uh, statement. I like mm, it. Yeah, yeah. I like, I mean, I've come to like it as well when, yeah. uh, um, when I first uh, discovered it through your work. Um, linked to that, maybe, it's a recent experiment mm -hmm. in many ways. I mean, Holmes yes. really started it, initiated it in, in the early uh, 20th century. And you have pointed out repeatedly as well that what we take to be the First Amendment is actually just 100 years old. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you had to uh, make us go through the journey of the First Amendment, bring the students through um, the various stops, uh, what, what will be the main phases? Well, I think, uh, of course, there is the uh, uh, adoption of the Bill of Rights yeah. following the um, uh, adoption of the Constitution, and of course that's in the 18th century. And then all through the 19th century there are debates about free speech and free press and, and uh, writings about it and, and uh, so on, but there's no Supreme Court case. I mean, that's yeah. the amazing thing. Um, even though the Supreme Court has decided uh, very early on in the uh, 19th century that it will be the final arbiter of what the Constitution means 
even though it's decided that, it doesn't decide anything about free speech, about the First Amendment, until its first decision uh, in 1919. So everything that we take of uh, take uh, today as part of the jurisprudence of free to spe freedom of speech and press, First Amendment, everything of that jurisprudence begins with 1919. As you yeah. know, when we teach uh, First Amendment, that's where we start. Um, so the second thing is to realize that that start is not an auspicious beginning. No. Uh, and there are three cases, uh, all of uh, which involve government censorship of uh, speakers, and the speakers are each uh, punished, sent to jail, uh, and the Supreme Court in each of those decisions, in fact authored by the great Justice mm -hmm. Holmes, says the First Amendment doesn't apply. Now by today's standards of First Amendment jurisprudence, that's an outrage. They should have been protected. Yeah. It's even worse than that because one of the speakers of those three cases was a candidate for president of the United States, Eugene Debs. Mm -hmm. And all he did was give a speech in Ohio in which he praised people who had resisted the draft, refused to uh, be drafted, uh, which was a crime, but he praised them. And only for that, uh, or for that only, he was prosecuted by the government. This is a candidate for president of the United States while he's in jail, he receives a million votes for President of the United States in 1920. So you start with this uh, really um, uh, extraordinary uh, set of decisions in which freedom of speech and press is not applied. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there begin to be second thoughts and doubts. And Holmes is the person who uh, articulates that. And he does it in the uh, decision that you just referred to, a couple of decisions. That begins then when uh, Louis Brandeis joins the court, a series of opinions in which they speak very eloquently and powerfully to freedom of speech and press. And by the 1930s, this is beginning to be uh, the way people start thinking about free speech uh, and the First Amendment. Then in the 1950s, it caves again, and the court gives in to extraordinary repression and censorship. It's only in the 1960s when the Supreme Court, in a series of decisions, uh, most notably New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, begins to articulate the strong principle of free speech, free press that we have today. So it's a hundred year journey, uh, starts uh, uh, poorly, uh, rises, falls again in the 1950s, and picks up uh, with the extreme uh, protections we have today, where in the United States, uh, speech is protected uh, more than any other nation in the world, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say, and also more than any other nation in human history, I think is probably also true. The current period, 2000, the, the beginning of the 21st century, if we were to take um, a long view, you know, we are 2050, we're looking back. Well, do you think this will be, is that going to be seen as a, as a time where the First Amendment is under duress a bit, under challenged? So it's a very interesting question. With the overview that I have just given and that I know you have talked about, uh, I think there are two ways to look, to answer mm -hmm. the question you pose. What will, what will now look like yeah. in 2030 or 2050? I think one view would be every time the nation has experienced a feeling of insecurity and threat, especially from foreign entities and nations, uh, the society through legislation, through government action, and through judicial decision has allowed excessive uh, repression and intolerance. That was true at the beginning in 1919. I said it was true in the 1950s. Um, if we are entering a period of uh, a really extraordinary sense of insecurity and sense of threat, uh, one might say that history shows 
we will lose our First Amendment uh, protections. And once that security passes, that insecurity passes, we will regain them and we will look back and say that was a terrible moment in human history, in U.S. history. But that's what one would predict based upon what has happened before. Mm -hmm. I think the other view, and I think it's the one I would subscribe to, okay. is that over the course of this century, free speech, free press has been so strongly articulated uh, through decisions and elsewhere that it has become an essential norm of the country where uniquely both the left and the right in American politics subscribe to this value. It's one of the few things I think you can say, on which you can say there is a general consensus about this value. That means that we are less likely to fall prey to our fears uh, and to uh, the impulse to be intolerant and, and mm -hmm. uh, to censor. We're less uh, likely to fall than we were in the 1950s and uh, in the period in World War I and, and outside of World War I. Uh, I think that's probably right. So I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that even though we may have some bumps along the road here, that in 2030, 2050, we will look back and say we sustained it. We were resilient. Yes. Looking at looking back and, and in the current period, uh, what are the key um, doctrines of the First Amendment or the key um, elements? What, what's making the First Amendment uh, such an innovative and kind of different um, perspective on, on freedom of expression? Well, I, I think the, um, there are a number of, of doctrines and, and uh, basic themes in the First Amendment mm -hmm. that I think one can highlight as characteristic of uh, American jurisprudence. I think one is uh, that political expression, public discussion of public issues uh, will receive the highest level of protection. And uh, that's, uh, I think, both on a theory that we're in a democracy and self-government uh, requires this kind of openness. I think it also fits with my own theories about tolerance. That is, mm -hmm. in the public sphere, we're going to be extremely tolerant in the area of speech in order to learn a lesson about uh, ourselves uh, and about tolerance more generally. But I think the public discussion, public issues, the political speech doctrine, uh, in a sense, is a primary uh, characteristic. I think, secondly, we will take this to what one might think of as an extreme. Uh, that is, we will protect speech uh, far beyond what a normal view would be of what's reasonable. Mm -hmm. So uh, the First Amendment is, as I often say, counterintuitive, not reasonable. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. protecting something that uh, goes to an extreme. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an extremely important uh, development, yeah. I think. It's uh, certainly in the um, hate speech area, yeah. the inciting area in um, libel, defamation, mm -hmm. all to an extreme. Uh, I'd say a third thing uh, is that uh, th there is a... Um, complexity uh, to the First Amendment uh, that I think is uh, fascinating. I've personally been interested in mm -hmm. the differential treatment of print media and broadcast media, mm -hmm. uh, which I think are, are based on different philosophies about how you organize um, uh, and think about free speech fundamentally. Uh, in the print area, it's uh, individuals and institutions have the right to say whatever they want and, and to curate their newspapers and uh, magazines however they want. The government can't interfere. And in the broadcasting, the basic philosophy has been it's the people and the information and ideas they receive that is important. And the corporate owners of the media cannot be the ones to uh, propagandize the public with this and the government stands as a protector of the people and their need for information and ideas against the corporate uh, owners. 
those have played out very interestingly. Um, I think the former uh, thesis there, the notion about the print media, has become dominant. I think the yeah. notions of broadcast mm -hmm. uh, regulation have uh, complete, almost completely faded. Mm -hmm. There are a number of other doctrines we could talk about, but those I think are principal ones. I was hoping you could maybe tell us about your favorite First Amendment decision. Um, I, I think it's New York Times versus okay. Sullivan. Can you tell us, can you present it to us? What yes. happened? So, um, in the United States, uh, in 1954, the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education. And that decision was uh, probably the most significant Supreme Court decision, certainly in the 20th century, maybe of all time. And it said that states could not, and the governments could not, discriminate against uh, Americans based upon their race. And in particular, you could not require African American children to attend African American schools and not permit them to go to uh, white schools. Uh, this was the beginning of a major transformation of American society. That debate continued and continues to this day. What does it mean uh, to engage in invidious discrimination uh, against groups, in particular uh, African Americans? Uh, our history of slavery, of uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, made this a uh, terrible, terrible uh, issue for the United States, uh, and we have had to address it. But Brown was the <clears throat> crucial decision. As, this, uh, as these problems uh, were being debated and, and resisted and sorted out in the 1950s and 60s, the New York Times ran uh, a uh, advertisement mm -hmm. that was by a civil rights group uh, from the South uh, in the United States, uh, but it was an advertisement, and it said uh, the police of Montgomery, Alabama, and the police, state police had done these terrible things, and this had happened, and this had happened. Please give money uh, to our cause. Um, the New York Times uh, edition that had that advertisement in it found its way, a few copies, to Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And the uh, county commissioner who uh, was in charge of the police, uh, though never named in the advertisement, decided to sue uh, the New York Times for false statements of fact uh, in the advertisement about the police and therefore about his responsibilities. So his claim was, you said false things, uh, false statements of fact about me, and that uh, has hurt my reputation and I want you to pay damages. Uh, any uh, reasonable person looking at this, uh, these facts, sees not a person really concerned about his reputation, mm -hmm. but a desire to punish the New York Times for publishing a civil rights, uh, pro-civil rights um, advertisement. The Supreme Court, uh, in an extraordinary decision, said uh, citizens must have the right to criticize their government officials. Uh, sovereignty lies with the citizens in a democracy. Self-government depends upon citizens being able to discuss uh, the performance of their officials. And to do that, they must have extraordinary protections uh, so that even negligence in saying falsehoods uh, will be protected. Only if you knew what you said was, uh, was false uh, or acted in reckless disregard of the falsity, only then can a government official sue you for a falsehood uh, about them that you've spoken. That was really very significant. But what was most significant uh, was this notion, articulated in, in really beautiful language, uh, that we live in a society committed to citizens being able to uh, discuss everything, uh, especially the performance of their representatives. And that uh, model uh, of, of uh, democracy and freedom of speech 
has become uh, the linchpin, the mm -hmm. core principle about thinking about free speech. I think it's uh, really outstanding. I have a different, an additional theory, but I think it's uh, very important. Lastly, I think what is so interesting about New York, New York Times versus Sullivan is that it happened in a period in which several things uh, came together. One was that people began to think in the United States about national issues, not just issues in our state, but national issues. And secondly, that was facilitated by new communications technologies, radio and uh, TV, which made it possible to reach people on a national uh, basis. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times was just beginning, as we see, to have copies distributed mm -hmm. around the country. Mm -hmm. So we were at a period when we needed to harmonize, have a single principle uh, about uh, freedom of speech and press. Otherwise, if you had individual states, 48 states having their own views, mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't have a viable discussion. I think the reason that's exciting is because it applies to today. Because what we have today is a rising amount of global issues, climate change, uh, uh, issues of, of economic regulation, interconnectedness, issues of migrations of people. We have global issues we have to face. And secondly, we have a new communications technology, the internet, mm -hmm. like radio and TV, that makes it possible to discuss Absolutely. these issues on a global mm -hmm. basis. And therefore, just like New York Times versus Sullivan was a response to its time, I think we need a global norm of freedom of speech and press, or global norms about this that are responsive to the, uh, the, the realities of our time, mm -hmm. global issues, global communications, the need of global citizens to be able to address these issues. And, and as you know, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan is, um, according to our work, uh, the work that you and, and I and others have done, um, is the most often referenced. Uh, it's First very Amendment. interesting that yeah. that's true. Uh, so I, it, it is, um, even if the, the, the decision does not adopt the same defamation standard as New York Times versus Sullivan, they will adopt the, the, the vision yes. behind it. And, and yes. uh, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's fa fascinating mm -hmm. and very interesting that you picked uh, that particular decision, which has been very popular around uh, the judicial uh, system, the interactive global judicial system. There is something in the air, I think, about the need for global norms uh, because of these massive changes, the Absolutely. need of people to be able to discuss them and the ability to discuss them. 